-hmm. Okay. 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 Uh, then I will start recording. Alexis, just inform you. Oh, it is already started. Sarah. Oh, okay. Great. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Okay. Uh, welcome, Alexis. Uh, and good morning, everyone. Nila Hocam and all the others. Good morning, Göksun Hocam. Um, today, um, I'm very happy and delighted to see Alexis and welcome her with our uh, talk. Uh, I will just make a very brief introduction about her, uh, but I am sure uh, it is no need because you already know Chanel Arc, uh, the firm and also herself. Uh, but uh, in any case, I will make an uh, introduction. Uh, Alexis Chanel uh, holds uh, her bachelor's degree of architecture from uh, SciArc and she has her master's degree of city planning uh, from MIT. Uh, and she is the uh, co-founder, founding partner of uh, Sanal Arc, which is a uh, design practice in urban uh, and architectural scales in Istanbul and also a research uh, practice as well uh, with the knowledge-centric and data-centric uh, research on urban and again architectural scale. Uh, and they founded their firm in 2002 and ever since uh, she and her firm is uh, one of the most uh, well-known prominent uh, firms uh, in Istanbul and she herself has uh, many publications and research uh, both in uh, local uh, context and also in international uh, context as well. So thank you very much Alexis again. Uh, welcome to our course. And yeah, the screen is yours. Uh, great, Samra. Thank you very much for inviting me. It's a pleasure. Um, yeah, Samra is somebody very dear to my heart and a very important part of our practice from the years past. Um, she was very instrumental in our Imaginable Guidelines project, um, which has only become even more pressing given the current pandemic and need for a better public space. Um, so it's a pleasure to be here and um, to be with Bacchishia University today. Um, I also wanted to express that I really appreciate the questions that the students put forth. So I'm going to give a talk today um, with a brief introduction um, of a, a normal, let's say, presentation of the practice and then veer off to try to address these questions that I have in front of me specifically. So even showing the original reports or client presentations um, for the projects to give insight into that kind of early phasing of the project. So I'm going to start here. Um, our practice's focus is um, very specific to public realm design and Istanbul. And I think one of the things that we fundamentally ask ourselves about our environments and the places we contribute is what draws us into life. Um, because this is one of the ways that architecture or design or the built environment can contribute to our quality of life. So how does design of place nurture social society? Um, it does not solve the problems of social society, but it certainly can um, be kind to it and celebrate it and um, uh, be a reflection of its expression. Um, in what ways do spatial and material design foster creativity and knowledge exchange? Again, um, we're, as human beings, we're very sensitive to our environment, uh, our comfort. If it's um, the environment is sympathetic to our, our senses, um, both aesthetically, but also in terms of heat and acoustics, um, as well as familiarity of materials or the quality of them or the, the care of them as well as I think one of the most important thing is how does formal expression or narratives offer meaningful, emotional or shared experiences? And I think this is, you know, it's said that the built environment is, a, you know, the reflection of a culture's values. Um, and mostly because the built environment does require the collaboration of many actors, um, social, economically, financially, programmatically users. It is never the act of an individual um, for, for lots of different reasons. And your job is to kind of celebrate those, um, 
aspects at, and maybe in some ways be a, a storyteller of those meanings and emotions and experiences. Um, somebody asked me about this diagram and we use it in every presentation that we give um, both externally, but also to new clients because the idea that commissioning a work of architecture or public realm is a linear experience is very naive. Um, a site has a very long history predating humans, but then also the humans kind of role of it and then societal shaping of that, you go into this environment, um, as well as you start to connect to the community that's there. And by doing that, you are kind of participating, sharing resources and exchanging knowledge with both that place, that community and your own expertise. The second we call this pre-design, connections and community. And it, it's also where we do a lot of data connect, collection, um, talking to people, trying to um, channel into what they're interested in and excited about, what they imagine a future project can bring to um, their aspirations. The next phase we call clarity and delight, which is traditionally in architecture would be called schematic design and concept design. So we explore, we reframe, we integrate those ideas into an architectural, spatial, or let's say pro public realm proposition. And, and through that, we kind of get to this next phase, which was really the expressions and the experience of this particular place with this particular investment and this particular set of users, which we call culture, principles, and technology. Um, and then as that moves into kind of becoming a place, uh, which is kind of, um, let's say, realization and occupation, synergy and synthesis, you see the place being animated and celebrated and new patterns emerging. And this diagram shows that this is not a linear process because once somebody, a group, you know, occupies a place, it will then start again and maybe it goes back to a schematic phase. Maybe it'll start back to kind of um, creating new communities. So it's a very iterative process. And throughout this, if you are um, a careful listener and a careful, um, you will constantly weave in that knowledge and, and recalibrate whatever you're doing to be, um, let's say the highest and best use or proposition. And again, this will happen for, you know, it's been happening for two to 3000 years in Istanbul. So we can imagine that it will be continuing to happen for at least two to 3000 years after our contribution. Um, we typically like to highlight that what drives us is this excitement about human knowledge, as well as a lot of the timeless practices. Um, these are two of our core research projects about sharing this intelligence. Um, the first being Hey, Imaginable Guidelines, which is a crowdsourced urban design guide, um, crowdsourced from the experts of Istanbul, as well as the emotional intelligence of the city through the contribution of artists. The other, the Bazaar Making Work, um, this is a timeless, um, intangible heritage, um, which has used, has not changed significantly as we understand over the past thousand years. And yet it very lightly and carefully brings fresh food, uh, social economy to every single neighborhood in a city as large as Istanbul, as well as throughout Anatolia. And phenomenologically, this is extraordinary. For example, if I told you I could build a 40,000 square meter structure that could do a million dollars of trade, put it up in one day and have it not even be noticed the next day, you'd tell me I'm mad, but it's happening every single day in Istanbul. Um, it happens at different scales, um, from a micro scale to one that is very kind of old and fatty, which is the same size as the first image. It is about 40,000 square meters in its total size. Um, it's a craft. Um, anybody who sails boats can appreciate how incredibly intelligent um, the, the system is of knots and ropes and tarps to use kind of compression and tension to make this metastructure. Um, and you can see here that one of the things that's so significant is the penetration throughout the city, um, as well as that it doesn't bias any particular day, that they're pretty evenly distributed throughout the weeks of the day as well. Um, I'm going to skip the video you can see on YouTube. Uh, just a brief on the other extreme um, of how can we kind of share our intelligences 
so that we can ask citizens to participate actively in the shaping of their city. If we want citizen participation into our cities, we have to make sure that they come with a base of knowledge so they can articulate themselves, that it's not fair to them or to the designers and let's say um, public sector that has to participate in this if we all don't share the most basic set of knowledge. And I, I always give the analogy of medicine. You know, my daughter, by the time she was in third grade, could talk quite articulately about her blood system, her nervous system, and how nutrition was an important part of caring for that. And yet, if you ask most citizens about the streets, their storm waters, the most simple aspects of their public space in terms of like, you know, bollards and curbs, um, they, they're very unfamiliar. And therefore, as in medicine, we have taught our patients how to talk about their wellness so that doctors can better serve them. And yet we have not taught citizens to talk about their cities that city designers and architects and public sector can better serve them. So we need to change this. Um, and this is a sample of that. So on the left, you have the expert knowledge who is um, articulating exactly what a crosswalk is, why it's important for the city, what are the kind of parameters, as well as suggestions um, and guidance on how to apply that in a city like Istanbul. And then on the right is a work of art that kind of um, has also reflected on this from um, another intelligence. We have outsourced this knowledge. And I think one of the things that we know both in the positive and negative of social media is that collective imagination and collective knowledge, when it is at its most fluid, produces the most interesting futures. Um, and here is an example of how that could be developed. So this is a street in Istanbul. All of the yellow is a road reclaimed for sidewalks just by taking the most simple things of what is a crosswalk, what is the minimum length, of a car, what is car parking, um, sorry, and, and re uh, consolidating that so that we give that space back to the public realm because when these streets were built, the knowledge may be not as efficient between the city engineers, um, the property owners, the designers, and um, the citizens. So this is not difficult to achieve. Um, it's just a matter of applying cooperation and best practice knowledge. Um, the other thing that we're very focused on in our projects is that every project is an opportunity to enhance public life and public space. As a human being, you actually don't take a consciousness to recognize when you walk over a property line. That And when we are out, we have a public life continuously through different spaces. So it's not a matter of being in public property by which you express yourself as a public identity, but actually being out in that world and how our communities of interest, for example, like the research library opposed to a public concert, all of these are part of our own sense of public identity as well as our contribution to our social society. So every project is an opportunity to explore this continuity. Um, the first one, Beaumonti is in um, Beaumonti, in Feriakoy. Um, you can see the fabric of the city, this, uh, let's say, backside ridge um, facing the other inner watershed of, um, that has now all been paved over by the bypass roads, um, surrounded by this piece of land it has only recently been constructed with the technology of high rise. So this land before high rise construction was too steep to build on or too costly to build on. And due to the nature of the high rise economy became very kind of um, uh, the sweet spot of all of those issues and became what it is today. Um, the basic idea was to um, enhance the quality of this historic asset, as well as reintroduce the ecology that was once here. Um, and also some of the species that used to be on this watershed and bring that consciousness back that we actually, our cities are built into a natural ecology and we can live more harmoniously with those ecologies. Um, and a section kind of showing that from the street through a gateway that celebrates that ecology to a common room and in this case, down to the art spaces. Um, and 
the quality of those art spaces, also trying to talk about these natural materials that we as architects always have the opportunity to talk about re-naturalizing the city. So we, we very intentionally use natural materials here like natural plaster, which is the historic plaster used um, from you know times a few thousand years, I, we believe. Um, to using natural cork and even the burlap, which is again, all natural. Um, um, and how you can use lighting and technology in a kind of um, say point specific way that offers a lot of flexibility, um, as well as rethinking this kind of common environment, which we all have access to, to celebrate very particular crafts you see in the city. So this celebrates the mirroring craft that you you see throughout the neighborhood of Fericoy and Bomanti of all the kind of original signs, um, as well as kind of rethinks that we, we can actually share sinks. We do not need to duplicate sinks for women and men necessarily. And maybe by not having space dedicated to duplication, we can use less. Um, we also through this project commissioned some um, initiatives, uh, NGOs, as well as kind of city think tanks. Um, this one from being Sh uh, Shahir and Tesfer. Um, and they brought in a workshop to actually look closer at the surrounding area and how it has changed over the past hundred years. Um, and I guess I'd like to end this project by saying, you always as the architect have this um, abstract tool of drawing and that gives you an opportunity to show that the city you want to see and you want to live in and also give and plant those seeds to suggest to others. So this ecology actually exists there now. It just is a matter of us cooperating together to bring it to life. And I'm not naive enough to think that maybe um, that wouldn't take a lot of hard work, but it's, it's there, um, it exists. It's not my imagination that this exists. Um, and it's just a matter of us cooperating to get it to exist. Um, and I believe that the more people interact with these types of environments early in their lives, the more that they will um, demand them when they are active citizens in their adult lives. Um, and this is that environment um, brought to life. Um, so I'm going to start stop here. This is kind of my standard presentation and move on. Um, I'm gonna skip salt, which you guys can see. Um, and move on to Shishane, which uh, quite a few of you had questions about. So this project was started in um, 2009, 2010. Um, it was a public-private partnership between the city, IBB, who is the landowner, and a private uh, investor to take a 30 year lease to operate the car park. Um, and we were brought on by the investment group as they wanted to develop a project that they thought would be both um, empathetic to the city um, as they were both young investors and very excited about the city they grew up in, as well as um, be a new example of how we can get cars out of the city by creating these much larger Vessels. So the, the cooperation was between the city and also the city of Beolu to remove cars from the city center streets, the historic center, and try to put them on the periphery, the historic periphery of this part of the city. So it hosts a thousand cars um, and it is connected to the metro. Um, and I was really happy somebody asked this question. Um, because it is exactly what we worked very hard um, for about a year to do. Well, the question is, um, Shishani Park is located um, and it has connection points for everyone. It has a connection with the subway, which has a heavy traffic flow around it. How did you deal with these many intense problems while creating an area people have to enjoy in the park? So I appreciate that you feel this way because we work very hard on it. One of the things that we did, as you can see here, is that we made sure that the car got in as fast as possible from the high speed road. So there's no, one of the things is this big ramp that you see coming down, it immediately takes the car from Tarlebasha Road into the bottom of the parking. 
Um, and by doing this, we take all of that traffic away from the Maidan, which has recently been um, redone quite nicely. Same from below, we immediately take the cars into the kind of main level of the parking. And from the other side, there's a tunnel that goes through. So one of the first things we did is set up all the parking structure and all the car circulation to stay where they are already at and then give the entire corner that faces the city over to the pedestrian. Um, the second thing we did is we worked really hard um, and fought really hard with the Metro. Now to probably all of your surprise, as it was to my surprise, um, the Metro engineering group and the city of IBB do not talk to each other very much. Um, and that may explain why a lot of our Metro stations are so mediocre and come out in very weird ways into the city. So it was not part of the vision to connect that Metro passage and we could not understand this. So we had many, many meetings with their engineers on how we could possibly do this. And one of the reasons this was a real struggle is because a lot of the equipment rooms and mechanical rooms for the subway are actually located between the corridor that's there and the big hall that we created that goes directly out to this lower plaza. Um, but as I have often experienced, if you just persevere, logic prevails. I mean, it just didn't make sense not to do it. Um, and now that Zemin Istanbul's there, we could also ask why can't Zemin Istanbul, the wedding salon, the parking operator, IBB and everybody come together to make that better. It is beyond my imagination why that's not possible. Um, but, you know, in time. Um, and what you can see here is, so you have that upper deck where people are coming and then they pull into this room. And this room is actually the exact same size as the courtyards of Yini Jami. Um, and it's actually defined by four sides, making it a very comfortable space to come into. Well, this comes up about one and a half, two meters to buffer all the acoustic noise coming in. Um, this was also really important because out on the Hollet you get a huge amount of noise coming up and hitting these buildings and hitting back into that, providing a very uncomfortable environment for human beings. In addition, to get down to here and see the city, we invited people directly on the paths. I'm sure now you can start seeing that shaping. So you come in and you just go directly down or you come in and you come directly in to actually see the silhouette of the city as well as see the 360 silhouette of the city. Um, and, and then come down into this lower plaza. Meanwhile, another deck down. Um, and another, the, sorry, I just wanted to show you here. Another important part of this was celebrating the ecology of the Hullage and again, reintroducing a lot of the species that grow in the Hullage onto this landscape and roof garden, but also creating a kind of we couldn't have water on this, so we created this metaphor of kind of water, which um, doesn't look so elegant here, but actually when you experience it, it glitters and it reflects the sun coming over. I don't know. If we want at the end, we can play the videos. I don't know why they're not playing, but there's like a video and you can literally, they act as mirrors and you can see the clouds coming across. Um, and just some photos of that. Um, the other thing that was very important here for us is that we could see the parking lot beyond a parking space and actually see it again, creating that emotional connection as a space on the weekends or on, um, let's say, seasons that are less used, hours being used as a cultural space and exhibition halls. And the moving museum took over the first two floors of this. And again, um, I think we find it really fun when you see images like this posted on Instagram, you know that um, the fun of this child will remain with him and he will now make a new relationship with some of these types of spaces in the city. Um, as I shared, the other very important thing here is again, just natural light, natural air, just makes people happier and more comfortable. And this tree um, now hosts a very large colony of sparrows. Um, and, 
And it just brings a certain level of delight um, to this functionality of the car park. Um, so I'm going to stop there. Um, somebody asked about these projects in Hajimimi, so I was gonna go over to them next. No, 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 sorry. Okay, so somebody asked me about this project, which is um, if we come here, uh, we got commissioned a few years ago to do a series of um, residences in Beolu um, for housing, um, residential. The idea, the city had this very strong ambition to rethink um, the private properties to to bring in residents. They were very um, exhausted by all the hoteling. They were finding people weren't living in Beolu. And because of this, um, they weren't getting a kind of enduring economy and quality of life, which as we know now has only been amplified in the last five years. So these properties were all bought under a different time when um, Turkey's economy was booming. Um, and Galata Port was the big dream. And so the big promise was that this whole neighborhood of between Topane and Galata Kule was going to be a new vibrant residential district. Um, that of course all changed after about 2012, 2015, when things started to um, politically change in the regions um, and the you know, adjacent countries started going to war with each other. In addition to that, with that, the lira reduced, making it very expensive to start doing construction. And then with addition to that, you had a whole series of kind of events that made people very um, anxious for what the city center was going to become um, and stagnating things. So most of these projects uh, remain somewhat um, unoccupied, um, although built. And I just wanna punctuate because people ask this question. So this, these projects have happened over six years. Um, it's been very difficult because all of them were designed for a very different economy. And how do you redesign and keep redesigning these structures given that, you know, the as you all know, the lira is worth almost, you know, I don't want to say half, but at least two thirds was it was before. So it's not just that the costs have gone up, but also the value um, of working has gone up. So you, and usually when you design, you design to the economy. So how do you make all of these detailings much less expensive? How do you make them not out of, let's say, imported materials, but only local materials, et cetera, et cetera. So it's a very interesting process, process to watch. Um, this is what it looked like when we got involved in the project. Um, and um, and that's kind of the build stock that was inherited. So, um, sorry. This is the project that, um, one of the ones that hasn't been built um, and somebody asked a question about, so I'm gonna read the question. Okay, Ed Jay. Um, is located in historic significant location and has adjacent structures. Could you briefly explain what kind of applications are performed in adjacent structures and what you think about this during the design process? Okay, so I'm assuming you're thinking about particularly here, um, which is a, um, there's two historic buildings here. Um, this building here on my left is actually a recreation of this historic building. So it's a concrete building built within the last, let's say, 10 years. Um, and I just want to come back to this, oh, sorry, I'm getting, uh, this image. I, I think we often think that this area is a historic district, but I, this is actually what's there. And even if we want to romanticize about Dawn apartment, um, it's pretty crude. Like if you look closely at it. Um, and this kind of ad hoc um, impact on the city over the past, let's say 70, 80 years is quite um, devastating. So I think it's a really good question because we ask it a lot in terms of how do we actually um, both take these ones that are really historic and have only gone into great decay 
and ensure that they can be cared for and they can um, be re reconstituted without this process. This process is a bit odd because they tear it down and then they put in this concrete building. And over time, it, it ends up also having its own odd life, um, which is not necessarily this just this decoration, but because it's not built with masonry and load bearing, um, it has other odd behaviors. So from a construction point of view, a structure like this, um, there is lots of techniques um, developed over the years for shoring up these buildings quite simply. And as I understand, because of the geology around here, it is a type of Gravac rock that is quite stable. So either, even though you're in an earthquake zone and even though you're doing this excavation, the rock, the bed, it's not bedrock, but the quality of the geology is quite suitable to keep these stable. So you, you shore up the side of the building and you create a shoring and then you, you build piles down to protect it all around. And you immediately put up your um, firewalls and your firewalls act as a way to kind of anchor and in some ways give seismic reinforcement to these buildings, especially if they want to use that in their future, as I understand um, the quality. Um, the other thing that is kind of interesting that let's say you can do in some of the new structures is these are very closed structures. So how can you kind of um, maybe make the street life more part of that and introduce ecologies into it? Um, I'll skip this part of it. This is where it's located. So this is this particular structure you asked about, 61. That photo I took before was from this project, actually, that is here, that is completed, that was looking over this way. And there's Dawn Apartment here, which again, I want to highlight, I, I do think is very precious and we should take care of it. I just wish the residents actually took much better care of this structure. As you can see, it's pretty, um, poorly treated. Um, it's placed in the city. Um, it's back there, looking around. Some of the kind of qualities of the streets, um, the murals, the toilets, the kind of spill out. Um, we love, you know, the ivy. One of the things that's also really difficult is while people aren't living in them, it's it's actually really difficult to, to um, take these deep root plants and, and put them on the buildings. But all of these buildings are designed to have these large species ivy grow on them. So this is the structure. This is the, the building we are asked to kind of rethink. It was a uh, atelier for plexiglass and metal. And as you can see, it's even substandard in its floor to floor. So a lot of these buildings were rebuilt in, let's say, the 50s and 60s when this became a kind of um, backup house studio economy um, to make signs, um, to make uh, printing shops. And again, a very substandard quality you can see um, that was built. There's its location. And as you can see, originally, there was this very big, beautiful garden um, in the back here over here in this kind of steep plot here. Um, this is the other thing that came up a lot in these buildings is this is literally your view um, looking out from the window. So as you live in these buildings, um, sorry. Um, as you live in these buildings, you have a very intimate relationship with the neighbor just across from you. And yet there's this kind of kindness that people have brought into their um, daily lives that I think is quite exciting. Um, so we wanted to create a little bit of a threshold between those experiences, a bit of a kind of Jumba or kind of plant box that you can create so that you can sit in as a, kind of picture window, but also that gives you a little bit of kind of privacy and buffering between those um, two areas. Um, I'll come back to these, these are videos of them. Um, as well as try to find a way to pull back the street edge to create a kind of porch and veranda. So um, as these streets have a very kind of um, flat edge, many times with the historic buildings, um, 
we thought it could be a really good opportunity with a new structure to actually use, take advantage of those double height spaces, plant some deep soil trees, as well as allow a kind of dialogue between the street and the inner use. <clears throat> so you would come up and enter the apartment building from here, excuse me, <clears throat> or go out to this porch or down to this kind of lower porch. Um, and that as you go up, we would use a kind of combination of the terracotta um, in a contemporary form, as well as the metal grills that you see throughout the city for the kind of corner window. And again, that's that view again. So your spot looking out or this more kind of smaller unit, again, looking out, whoops. Um, and then that back garden. So this is a view of an apartment that looks out in the back garden. Um, and that's that room and how we can kind of create these like soft rooftop ecologies as well as use the handrails um, to grow very large species trees very efficiently on the facade. Um, and that's an overall section of that idea. Um, what we did here is use the Jumba spaces to get more light in as well as kind of potentially put species on there. Um, and then the plan views of how that would kind of come to life. Um, and the section going down the street. Again, trying to use this building proportion to give a rhythm um, to that. And then back the other way, this is a different view. So let me see, I was just gonna try to find the, I think I have a, So this is a view trying to describe that process a bit. So you have the terrain, you have the street level. Um, at the street level, you have one type of window coming in and out, um, which is a bit different than the upper floors. And the upper floors, you have this kind of uh, atelier or residential that's quite compact. And then you have this roof line. Um, you have lots of materials that are decaying, a lot of kind of characteristic additions that um, are not so characteristic in a positive way. The new outline that we suggest, keeping a very open facade, um, bringing more light into this, but then using a lightweight screen um, to grow plants and provide privacy, um, as well as kind of animate a roof garden. Um, okay. So. Um, so another question here um, was about this project, um, Rasatane. And what I thought I would show you here is kind of the really crude drawings that we did originally for it to talk with the client, um, where this, this one looks at, um, so let me go back one, sorry. So this was a project we did as a master plan for um, Bosphorus University. Let's see if I can find this right. Okay. So this is the master plan for the university. The idea was to create a research campus um, for advanced research. So it would not cater to core education, which their current campus in um, Rumli Hisar does, or their Kilios campus. So Kilios would focus mostly on the youngest students for um, prep and um, language schools. And then the idea would they would come into the, the Rumele Hisar campus for core education, undergraduate and graduate education. And then Rasadhane could be used for advanced research, so postdoctorate and research projects, um, as well as um, kind of their core knowledge groups. So they have the seismic group, the I think the physics and geotech group. And in this case, to put biotechnology also onto this campus. 
Um, and therefore graduate students and undergraduates would come out here <clears throat> for maybe laboratory work or applied knowledge, but this core would serve kind of transdisciplinary thinking and researchers that are, are affiliated with the university trying to create a global hub. So one of the questions was, how do you, um, you know, come to the geometries? And I'm assuming you're thinking, um, sorry, these geometries here. Um, and I'll just um, zoom into that. So one of the things that we did early on with this client was look a lot at how they build. So this one, and explored this kind of ad hoc way that they were actually building. That if you're going to just build a new structure of some quality every two years, maybe you should just do a master plan that actually allows for that ad hoc work. Or if you want to just do a few major projects over the course of the next 20 years, each with like multi-million dollar budgets, maybe you just do a few major meta projects. Um, or, oops, or if you really want to focus on how the research institutes um, interlink with each other and constantly connect so that if you're in one space of the building, you just naturally flow into another and you naturally come into an existing one and naturally flow around. Um, you would have a continuous experience where you focus more on the corridors and the connections and the layout and organization of that than the actual architecture itself. And what the client said is this is what they want from a point of view of daily usage. Um, this is what they would always struggle with budgets because they will never get that type of money where they have like 20 to $50 million just to build large research facilities. Um, but that neatness is something very desired. But in reality, this is how they built. So it was a little bit um, a way to talk about these things. Um, so this was a very early presentation. But once you start working, sorry, I'm just going to see if I can. This is the full report. Um, and this is, it's a, you, you work on these parallels. So somebody asked me how we begin projects as well. Well, one of the things we begin with is what are our principles and what, what is our sense of purpose? Um, as far as kind of what's on the site and qualities of kind of sustainability and, and where are you in the city? You know, what, what, you know, what is your historic role in contributing to the city? <coughs> as well as very real things like what is, you know, your or what variances are you asking? The, the principal things is really thinking uh, through those value propositions. And in this case, this value proposition also had to do with how to put Turkey on a global map and how to interrelate them to other centers. Um, and even other centers within Istanbul. So we were finding that these are the universities of uh, but in fact, you know, most of these universities are clustered as you are as well along here. So we're quite isolated, which, which is why we, we also stuck to the thing that, that this works really well for research because researchers tend to, to want a bit more of, um, let's say a quiet environment. They tend to be very dedicated over a long period of time. So they don't need um, as much access where graduate students and undergraduate students, quite the opposite. They need high interaction, they need high accessibility, they need high infrastructure of housing, of which none of this we had. Um, so we look closer. Another important thing was um, we always look at a lot is how the weather works. If you have these large campuses, I'm sure you've all experienced this at um, places like Istanbul Technical University, IASA, it rains and it's cold in Istanbul and walking between these large buildings is miserable. So really having an understanding of when the weather um, and wind is working. Um, the other thing we looked a lot at is all the slopes of the site. So where you could actually um, get the most horizontal so it was easy to walk amongst. And where the actual um, large species habitats are. One of the 
ideas is that the Bosphorus, um, a lot of the Bosphorus has been planted in the past 40 or 50 years. Um, and I'm not saying that we go through and cut a bunch of trees down, but we should actually take maybe a finer look at that because um, a lot of the, the Bosphorus is planted um, with pine trees that are, um, can be regenerated in nice ways and therefore focus on the, the kind of larger species to care for and the watersheds rather than this kind of naive blanket idea that, um, so we looked at that very carefully and, and where those were, um, as well as some of the existing water structures um, and kind of concluded these types of species maps. Um, but you also have a lot of other really important things that I want to bring attention to, like fire access. Um, so how do you get fire trucks in and out of these sites? And, and how do you put in these large programs? Um, so coming back, it's kind of a give and take of all of these competing issues. Um, so again, what is our principle? Who do we want to get out to there? How do we want them to interact with each other? And then does our layouts and the kind of walking between achieve those things? And when we get all of those things together, here's our fire access maps and our kind of road sections. Um, what, sorry, and then the species, doo, 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 sorry. You start kind of finding that you, you get this kind of flow of things going on, right? You want to move the body along kind of, along those edges and into these courtyards, across these spines. So it was a combination of kind of those pathways that we brought up earlier uh, so that you could kind of continuously walk through and loop through but then also had some very clear spines and axis points that you could go through. So see if I can find that. Um, and then as it matures. Oh, sorry, I was trying to find. So I've just never done talks this way with random. Sorry. Okay. Well, I'm going to skip it. So that to kind of answer that question, I don't know where that diagram is. Oh, there it is. Um, so that's what this actually represents. A lot of these are kind of walking distances and loops around um, focal points for um, more introverted places that you can take trail walks through, um, but as well as these kind of very clear axes through um, and ceremonial places. Um, okay. Then, um, so I thought I would end showing another project that we just started. Um, so very early on, um, and sometimes in new projects, we need to kind of, um, change our frameworks and imaginations. Um, even the best of us, because I personally have never done a theme park. Um, so I had to think about stories and how we go into stories and how different characters combine in stories. So this was how we did this process. Um, this is like the raw presentation that we did to our clients. So you can get a sense of exactly how we work. Um, so we wanted to create a place to be in. And we, we used narratives um, to kind of understand that. And then characters juxtaposed to those narratives to think about place. So we had Nemo and Jumanji. So this was really about geographies that are familiar and fixed um, and that you move through these geographies in a map. So the imagination has to do with how you interact with known um, natural settings. Nemo had the same experience as he went from um, his <clears throat> environment uh, down. The next one was looking at this notion of biophilia through Avatar. Um, and how this absolutely magical, um, imagined, um, transcendental uh, natural landscape was explored. And for this, we used Alice in Wonderland. Um, again, having that kind of transcendental experience and what that brings. And then the last one um, was Black Panther and not only Wakanda, but also how they also use the adjacencies to cities 
So this was how we we kind of reimagine cities um, and how we have uh, how we kind of constantly rethink the scale of our cities in terms of the grandness of them, but also the kind of finer grain and, and daily lives. And that is not so different for us, at least for Anna and her adventure to save her sister. Um, um, and what we basically came to understand is that we don't need to do a theme park. What we can do is just a very immersive environment um, and create a forest, a kind of what we're calling Playtopia now, which really focuses on public play and entertainment and a set of marketplaces. And here, coming back, how do we start? We come with our core values. So our core sense of purpose is we're gonna build a forest, we're gonna make a play park, and we're gonna have marketplaces and how we blend these things together and what these things bring to us emotionally and socially. So nature, curiosity, nature, we want something enduring, kind of experience culture, user-generated content, but then you know we also have to get a cup of coffee to and talk with our friends and memory making. We're also given most of the time very real programs. So, you know, we need this many parking spots and this many, you know, rides and this many tenants and how do you get that all in there? Um, but oftentimes we also will analyze and maybe make suggestions to our clients of what would be make even better for public life as well as um, their own enduring kind of um, investment. So for this one, we also suggested that they create a multimodal transit hub, um, connecting to the two metro lines planned for the future, create a town center for the residences, um, <clears throat> some connection roads that won't make sense in this context, um, make good quality streets that all streets aren't equal. So maybe make some boulevards, some kind of local streets, um, connect to the city park, regenerate the watershed that they're sitting on, and um, optimize the typology of the buildings. And by this, we mean do not build on top of parking um, because it just makes for really expensive underground buildings. Um, and we do basic summaries of those diagrams. So here's a hierarchy of streets. Here's connecting that modal transit hubs. Here's the town center. Here's all of our deep soil that we want to maximize and keep. We want to connect to this park so you don't have this line, in fact, that this becomes um, not there um, to regenerate this watershed coming through. Um, and what we typically do, as I showed you before, is we generate three schemes that actually look at this in the extreme so that we can explore our own creativity and our own organizational skills. Um, and usually we end up with a scheme that combines all of them um, in the end. So I was gonna show you what that starts to look like. Um, and this is what we gave the client. This is a menu that we gave them that showed the three schemes um, from a, a kind of concept point of view to how the parking and circulation and um, you know trash servicing could work to their major program of forest, play and market to then how that can turn into their features, um, to how that can turn into kind of edges and how you deal with kind of um, security. Um, and then showing how each one of those environments would be slightly, um, let's say, um, materially different. Um, and then generally how you, know, you, you want to create these kind of adventure and forest, you want these new kind of experiences you want the body to move and interact with these landscapes. You want to be able to have seasonal events and timely events. You want to invite new expressions and imaginations. Um, you want it to be fun. I mean, there's just not enough fun in our lives, I think. Um, how you can bring water in and how kind of um, decay and, but also these kind of um, more, um, let's say natural environments or environments that create themselves um, an event culture. So I'm gonna end there. That's kind of what I have to share. I'm going to, um, sorry, I'm coming back to you. Um, here we are. Um, I'm gonna stop sharing. Um, and I'm gonna answer the last question somebody had, which is, I, I know somebody also asked about um, Orta Mahale, but I think, um, that's kind of been covered, is what's the difference between civic and civil? Um, I'm sorry. And to you yourself, Esmer, right? 
uh, we can't see you. We don't see you, even though you close. Yeah, it, yeah, it came now. Yeah. Hold on. Somehow, I don't, Summer, you're muted. Oh, um, um, so well, probably it's from like previous times, as you can uh, hear me now. Um, I was going to end saying, what's the difference between civic and civil? So civil. Um, it's our daily lives. It's our housing. It's our local shops. It's the marketplace. And civic is our kind of collective cultural lives, like, um, you know, governance. Um, in this case, I would put universities and schools. Um, but also, in that case, things like public markets. So you could argue that um, a civic structure is a charship, where a kind of local maidan and mahale street is civil. Um, you could argue that a kindergarten is civil, where the kind of collective public high school, um, like an anadolu say, is civil. One is really about our greater supporting the social and cultural and infrastructure for our greater social, let's say, um, civilized aspirations. Um, and the other one is really the infrastructure to support the success of our families, our daily lives, and the communities that we love. So, yes. And so if anybody has questions, um, we have the chat box here. Thank you very much, Alexis, for such a really lovely, poignant, and I must say very transparent talk you gave. I assume, like, uh, I think it could be like uh, stressful and hard, but it was great. You really could address all the questions and you address actually like many issues that we have talked and mentioned uh, during our courses. Even the keywords uh, seems parallel. Uh, I hope uh, the listeners also could detect those and somehow maybe take notes and stuff. So thank you again.